Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum coach, Reiki master, and theta meditation teacher. Above all, an inquisitive soul. Since my early childhood, I've been on a quest to find out how life really works. And the best clue I've got so far is the sacred alchemy of physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, mind, body and spirit, which together reveal the truths we all want to know. Who am I? Why am I here? What life is all about? How can I live my life to realize my highest potential with fulfillment, prosperity and joy? How can I manifest what I want? I'd love to share with you on this podcast what I have learned over the years and bring you inspiring conversations with my guests who will share their expertise as well. Welcome to the brand new, exciting season four of Quantum Living. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. I hope that the title of today's episode has intrigued you. Is consciousness all that is? A profound and loaded question with a bit of play of words, as we often refer to God, the Creator, as all that is. To explore the answer to this existential question, I have invited someone whose credentials and contribution to the field of science and spirituality are second to none. My very special guest is Dr. Eben Alexander, a physician and teacher at Harvard Medical School and elsewhere, renowned academic neurosurgeon whose life was completely changed by the full recovery from a serious bacterial brain infection he was not expected to survive. Amazingly, his week-long coma turned out to be a vehicle for a profound, transcendental near-death experience, or NDE. Since his NDE, Dr. Alexander has dedicated himself to sharing information about near-death experiences and other spiritually transformative experiences and what they teach us about consciousness and the nature of reality. A pioneering scientist and thought leader in consciousness studies, Dr. Alexander has been a guest on The Dr. Oz Show, Oprah, ABC TV 2020, and Good Morning America, amongst many other programs, and has given numerous lectures and presentations all over the world on this topic. His books, Proof of Heaven, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Afterlife, and The Map of Heaven, How Science, Religion, and Ordinary People Are Proving the Afterlife have collectively been, for over two years, at the top of the New York Times and international bestseller list. His latest book, co-authored with Karen Newell, Living in a Mindful Universe, A Neurosurgeon's Journey into the Heart of Consciousness, was published in 2017. I'm delighted that Dr. Alexander has accepted my invitation to appear on my Quantum Living show to talk about consciousness. And now he joins me from Charlottesville in Virginia. Hello, Dr. Alexander. Welcome to Quantum Living. Oh, hello, Anna. Thank you so much for having me on. It's great to be with you today. It's such a pleasure. We are now at the intersection of science and spirituality. (laughs) a space that you are very familiar with, clearly. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's a real honor for me to be here with you. And I certainly when I saw your kind of mission and the things that you uh, support and put out to the world, I realized there's a tremendous amount of overlap. So this is a very natural conversation. I will include your full bio in the show notes. And of course, my listeners can read in detail about your ND experience in your books. But as much as your ND experience and your miraculous recovery were truly amazing, and as I understand, it was just the beginning of your spiritual journey. And that's what I would like to talk about and would like it to be the focus of this conversation. Your unique understanding of consciousness, of who we really are, 
of our purpose in life, that death is just a transition, and what is the other side. I've got some specific questions to serve as the focal points, and then, as it is always my intention on this podcast, I will ask you to bring your knowledge and insight you have shared with us down to the practical level, how we can use it to live a better life, what is really important that we understand and apply. I know that you have recounted your story dozens, if not hundreds of times, but to set the scene for this conversation, Eben, could you please tell us briefly about your near-death experience, your life before it, and what happened when you woke up from the coma? Okay, well, I think it's important to point out who I was before. Uh, when all this happened back in um, November 2008, I'd spent the first 54 years of my life owning a very kind of conventional scientific worldview, uh, and that was basically a, a slave to what is known as physicalism, the notion that only the physical world exists and that uh, brain must somehow create consciousness out of physical matter. Uh, and I subscribed to that. I, you know, as much as I'd wanted to believe uh, there was more to all this and an afterlife. I mean, my father was very scientific. He was an academic neurosurgeon, uh, uh, globally renowned, but he had a very strong faith in God. And he never had a conflict uh, with his faith in God and a loving personal God and the power of prayer in its use uh, for him as a neurosurgeon in treating patients uh, and uh, his scientific knowledge. And yet I grew up in the 60s and 70s, like so many others. Um, I knew science was the pathway to truth. And also, like so many others, I made the mistake of thinking that materialist science, which is the very low hanging fruit of science, which completely ignores quantum phenomena and quantum physics, um, you know, you you end up uh, not getting to the right answer. So anyway, uh, this is where um, my life was altered was through this experience. Now, important to point out that an unusual aspect of my near-death experience is amnesia, that I had no memory of Evan Alexander's life, any of the events of my life, humans, earth, this universe, everything was wiped from my memory. And of course, when I first came back to this world in the first few weeks, I simplistically kind of defaulted to my old explanations because I was just beginning to learn how sick I had been during that coma and how badly uh, infected my brain was, my neocortex, completely disabled uh, through the this devastating illness. But I was just beginning to uncover all that in the weeks after my coma. And um, all I knew was this extraordinary journey I'd, I'd been on during that week. In fact, when I woke up in the uh, ICU on day seven of coma, and my doctors said I'd gone from a 10% chance of survival at the beginning of that week down to a 2% chance of survival, but no chance of recovery by the end of the week. And that's why my case has garnered so much attention in the scientific community, is the medical details are irrefutable and, in fact, are confirmed in a case report that appeared in the Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases in uh September of 2018 by Dr. Serbi Khanna, uh, Lauren Moore, and Bruce Grayson. And that case report makes it very clear. They go much further than I did with the supporting data from my medical records uh, to show that my brain could not have produced any kind of dream or hallucination, and certainly not the incredibly robust, ultra-real uh, and memorable and life-changing set of events that I witnessed. But the other thing that they point out in the case report is that my very survival uh, was a deep mystery and unprecedented in the medical literature. But what they offered to the case of, uh, to the peer reviewers at the medical journal when they were challenged, how do you explain this case? Nobody gets this sick from bacterial meningoencephalitis encephalitis and then ends up having a full recovery. And they said, it's because he had the NDE. Mm. And that was good enough for the peer reviewers. They said, okay, we have an explanation. Uh, so anyway, but now deep into the journey, I just want to share briefly what that experience was that I knew so, so well when I woke up in the ICU bed. Um, first of all, it started in what I call the earthworm's eye view, very primitive course, kind of unresponsive realm. It's like being in dirty jello, and I had strong tactile sensations and awareness, but no body. I never had any kind of body awareness during any part of this journey. And that seemed to go for a long time. And at that point, I already had zero memories of this world, this universe. That empty slate was in effect. 
Uh, and then there was a slowly spinning white light it came packaged with a perfect musical melody. And that served as a portal, a wormhole up into the Gateway Valley, a brilliant, ultra real uh, realm that had many Earth-like features. I was a speck of awareness on a butterfly wing. There were millions of other butterflies looping and spiraling in vast formations. There was a meadow down below. It was really perfect. I mean, there was no death or decay, all the plant life, everything blossoming, blooming, uh, growing, just incredible festivities going on and uh, merriment and, and a, a truly a festival that was being fueled because up above were these swooping orbs of pure angelic beings that uh, when I wrote it all up weeks later, I said they were angelic choirs, but they were emanating chants and anthems, hymns that would just thunder through my awareness and just show me the power, majesty, awe, and the deep personal uh, nature of that loving God force at the core of all existence. And uh, so in that realm, I was not alone. There was a beautiful spiritual guide. She was a, a young woman, sparkling blue eyes, high cheekbones, high forehead, soft brown hair. She was dressed in the same kind of simple peasant garb as the thousands of beings dancing in the meadow below us, but all with very rich colors beyond the rainbow. And she looked at me with this look of pure love, and she never had to say a word, but her message to me was very deep, profound, and refreshing, reassuring. You are deeply loved and cherished for forever. You have nothing to fear. You were deeply cared for. And another part of the message that I reported in Proof of Heaven, you can do no wrong. And I wish I'd expanded on that much more because apparently in the book, some people think that means, oh, we can do anything we want. Nothing matters. And that mm. is the opposite of the truth. <laughs> what what indie ears will tell you and what uh, once we encounter the spiritual realm and we go through things like a life review, uh, where our life flashes before our eyes. It's not just a vague remembering of things as much as a reliving of things and with a way to actually change history, change our future. And all of that is part of, uh, uh, part of our journey as souls. Now, it turns out that this particular level, this gateway valley that I'm talking about was not the end point. It was a gateway. And the angelic choirs provided yet another musical portal. And I remember seeing all of the lowest of four dimensional, you know, this material realm collapsing down, all of that rich spiritual realm with its whole different ordering of causality. Very important to point out, there's something called deep time, which is a different kind of ordering of things. It's kind of like meta time. It's how time is organized. And that's why you can go through a life review and have it be a reliving of your events, not just a remembering. Uh, and that shows you how much power is available in that kind of section of the universe to allow us to live our entire life you know, in the blink of an eye and go through all the meaningful uh, kind of steps. Well, anyway, that's deep time, but even that collapsed down until I entered what I call the core, an infinite inky blackness, a dazzling darkness. It was filled to overflowing with the divine love of that God force, of that same, very same force that, that, uh, uh, Prophets, mystics, uh, journeyers for thousands of years, the source of all of our religious systems have been these journeys, these kinds of events that allow us to glimpse a much grander aspect of the universe. And that's what I was witnessing in the core realm. And also a very powerful concept is oneness with the divine. I mean, that core realm is where, where you find that we're never really separate from God. In fact, that God force is the very source of our conscious mm. awareness. Um, and I remember in the core being told, we'll teach you many things, but you'll be going back. You're not here to stay. Uh, and it turns out I would tumble back down to that earth where my view. And by remembering the musical notes, the melody, I could conjure up that portal that took me up into the Gateway Valley. Uh, always every passage through there, uh, connecting with that beautiful young woman on the butterfly wing. And of course, those who've read Proof of Heaven realize her identity was absolutely essential to the story, even though I didn't know it when that was unfolding. But four months after my coma, I received a picture in the mail uh, that had to do with the fact that I was adopted. Uh, I reunited with my birth family, uh, you know, a year before my coma. Uh, but didn't even know they they existed uh, other than looking for my birth mother in the years before that, and then getting a, a perceived rejection from my birth mother in the year 2000. And I think that's an important aspect of this story is, uh, in many ways, an NDE is always, always, always is tailored to the individual soul. That's mm -hmm. it. Uh, and uh, 
that's the only responsibility of the NDEs to help that soul come into a deeper alignment with self and understanding. And that's what this NDE provided for me in very powerful terms. It just so happens that the rest of the world is also interested in NDEs that have this uh, incredible ability to offer us some statement about the brain-mind connection. And that's exactly why the scientific community has embraced my uh, story. If you go to BigelowInstitute.org and look at the 29 winning essays proving the afterlife from last year, many of them refer to my case. Uh, just look at Jeffrey Mishlov's first place entry. And it it just shows basically how much power is there in these stories. And when you realize my story is actually very common, that's why Proof of Heaven was such a giant bestseller as it resonated with uh, tens of thousands of people around the world who had had these experiences themselves didn't know how to put it into words, didn't necessarily share it with anybody because they're so shocking. You come back thinking you might've gone crazy and you don't necessarily want to confess this to your doctors. You might be put on medication. Anyway, so in this journey, uh, I, I cycled through these realms uh, multiple times, and this is all reported in Proof of Heaven, and also big aspects of my personal story are in the book Living in a Mindful Universe, especially a lot of the follow-up stuff, like the response of the scientific community and the embrace of the medical community uh, in the hospital where I had worked and where I was hospitalized, uh, where they invited me to give a, a, a dinner to you know, ex uh, talk about all this to more than 120 of my fellow doctors. So they took it very seriously. They were absolutely astonished by this recovery. And I think that's really the central lesson of all this. Now, it turns out to finish my story, uh, you know, and there's much more to it, but there came a time at the end where I was no longer able to use a memory of the musical notes to conjure up that light portal from the, from the earth where my view into the gateway valley. And at that time, I had learned that I could trust in the universe, that I would be taken care of, even though I was very frustrated that I could no longer ascend into these spiritual levels like, like I had earlier in the journey. And that was when I saw uh, thousands of beings going off into the distance around me, heads bowed, uh, many holding candles, head, uh, hands up in front of them, this murmuring energy. And what I called all that weeks later when I wrote it all up was the power of prayer. And it was really summoning me back. I didn't know back to where, but uh, I was on my way back to this realm. And that's exactly what happened. Then I saw six faces that bubble out of the muck. They were very important because they, five of them were physically present in the IC room the last 24 hours of coma and basically demonstrated to me that the vast majority of my coma journey had to happen between days one and four, and maybe days one and five of my seven-day coma. I go into all that in the book, all the details that are important to get. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, in those six faces, the last one I saw was of a 10-year-old boy. Now, I didn't recognize him, and there was this pleading energy coming from him. Turns out that was Sunday morning, day seven of coma. The doctors had just held a family conference where they said I'd gone from 10% to 2% chances of survival, no chance of recovery. They recommended stopping the antibiotics and just letting me go. That's when Bond, my 10-year-old son, who had been protected from the worst news during the week, heard this and knew all of a sudden things were much worse than they told him so far. He ran down the hallway. There I was uh, on the ventilator, eyes taped shut. He pulled open my eyelids, one eye looking over here, one eye over there, neither pupil working. Those in medicine know what a horrible picture that is. I promise you, I did not see him with my eyes. I didn't hear him with my ears, but his pleading with me, Daddy, you're going to be okay. That got through. And there I was deep in coma, getting ready to exit this world forever. And that pleading with me drove me back. I All through this journey, with the amnesia, I thought this can continue, it can cease, doesn't matter. But now all of a sudden everything mattered. And it was really the only fear I felt in the whole time during this journey was this pleading with me and knowing I had to come back for him. I had a responsibility of love with this fellow soul, even though I didn't know who he was, you know, what you know the son, a son would be for me, et cetera. And so that's when I came back to this world. And when I did, when I opened my eyes in that ICU bed, fighting the ventilator, and they finally extubated me, I did not recognize loved ones at the bedside initially, my mother, my sisters, my sons. I had no idea who they were, uh, but it took several hours for language, memories, a lot of things to come back to me. But in fact, my semantic knowledge, my full knowledge of cosmology, physics, everything I'd ever learned did not fully return for about two months after the coma. And that's something we talk about in great detail in Living in a Mindful Universe is 
uh, the scientific uh, proof that memories are not even stored in the brain. So that's kind of the last nail in the coffin of materialist neuroscience. But uh, the rest of it has been a 14-year journey of discovery, working with scientists around the world, coming to a deeper understanding of uh, the nature of brain, mind, and that connection, the nature of reality. But most importantly, the power we all have to bring healing and wholeness into our lives. That, I think, is the most important lesson to be learned from NDEs. And also, of course, uh, it's not just about what happens when we die, but by far, uh, the big giant message coming from NDEs is how do I live this life today, every breath, every moment, and how I deal with myself and with others that fully respect, respects and reflects everything I know about my relationship with the universe. And that's where human beings can gain tremendous power through meditation, through centering prayer, modes of going within, exploring this mental aspect of the universe uh, and realizing how interconnected we are, the information we have access to, and the power of our free will as higher souls. Uh, the other important distinction is that it's not about the ego. And so many of us live in an ego mind, and that's all we know. Wow, what an amazing story. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. And we'll be coming back to some of those details and topics throughout the conversation. Reincarnation is such an evident fact of life, as far as I'm concerned. As a child, I had vivid memories of my past lives, which my parents, of course, dismissed as dreams and told me to stop talking nonsense. Although no one could explain how I was able to read fluently at the age of three without being taught a single letter, while I kept telling them that I was here before and I simply remembered the language. Then when I was about five or six years old, I asked my father a very strange question. How do I know that I am me? <laughs> Which was very profound for my age. And that was my way of saying, who am I, essentially? My father looked at me as if I suddenly grew a pair of horns <laughs> and didn't know what to say. That was my first attempt to articulate the strong spiritual awareness I had, trying to understand it intellectually. So my first question I'd like to ask you is very dear to my heart, and it is at the center of my quest to understand how life really works. What is consciousness and what is its purpose? Consciousness is awareness of existence. Very simple. We don't have to, you know, go wild about this. Consciousness, when we discuss it, is all about the fact that we're aware of existing uh, with, you know, the environment that we are in, that kind of thing. Now, it turns out that, uh, you know, simplistically, uh, Looking at that, we then we see the obviousness of the material world around us. So, of course, we have to then assume that the brain is creating that consciousness out of physical matter. And that's where you really start running into trouble. And there's tremendous scientific evidence that the brain does not create consciousness. And uh, the examples I know in clinical neuroscience are things like terminal lucidity, where people a very, uh, you know, kind of common uh, adventure where people who are demented, uh, going into coma at the end of life for various things like Alzheimer's, what have you, uh, suddenly come back to life, often within hours or a few days of dying, uh, and in ways that completely defy anyone who's trying to pretend that the brain is creating consciousness. Because sometimes this happens in a brain that has been inactive for months and has been where, for example, you've had metastatic cancer more than. Uh, half the brain being replaced by cancer, and yet people can still demonstrate this terminal lucidity. So it's a really profound uh, kind of example of how uh, we are souls. We are eternal souls. This is not about brain creating consciousness, but the brain serving more as a filter for primordial consciousness. And that's where we really go in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe, and where others are going in this modern scientific push for understanding quantum physics and the nature of reality, uh, taking neuroscience, philosophy of mind, uh, parapsychology, all these lines of evidence into uh, um, consideration 
uh, what we end up realizing is that consciousness is a fundamental property of the universe. This self-awareness is a property of the universe. It can be borrowed by sentient beings. And there's something about brains that allows them to filter in phenomenal conscious states. Uh, but ultimately, they're not being created within the brain itself and simply by the laws of physics, chemistry, biology applied to the substance of the brain. That's the important thing to get here. And that's what quantum physics has been screaming at us for the better part of a century. Uh, but, you know, wise old homo sapiens has been a little slow on the uptake. And you can't, the thing is, this is, consciousness is so giant. It's really the only thing any one of us has ever known. Uh, nobody's ever known or existed in anything other than consciousness. Uh, but in fact, materialist scientists will try and tell you that consciousness doesn't even exist, that it's an illusion or an epiphenomenon of chemical reactions, electron fluxes in the brain. So they'd be screaming at you, there's no way you have free will. And yet that sense of free will is very real and alive and has to do with quantum physics, uh, with these effects on the brain and the fact that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is at work in every moment of every perception, thought, belief, and attitude you have uh, through the uh, you know ion channels, synaptic vesicles, and microtubules of the neurons in your brain. So is that primordial consciousness the intelligence that we call God? I would say that that primordial intelligence, yes, it's, and this again is what near death experiencers have encountered for thousands of years across all belief systems. I mean, the deep nature of the accounts overlaps beautifully. There's not a, an inconsistency uh, between them. So that's where uh, it's important to realize how, how much this kind of deep truth is apparent to us. Um, from all the lines of inquiry that we can pursue in trying to address the fundamental nature of consciousness itself. Mm. Are there new souls still being created or are we all being recycled, so to speak? Well, there's certainly tremendous evidence for recycling. Uh, and this is something I was not aware of before my coma, but it's the scientific evidence for reincarnation. And it's really indisputable. In fact, it's one of the strongest arms uh, of this whole discussion about the mind-brain connection, the nature of soul, uh, is the reincarnation data. And it comes from many different lines of inquiry. Uh, one of the most solid academic sources for the last six decades has been the University of Virginia, Division of Perceptual Studies. Originally, Dr. Ian Stevenson back in the late 1960s, who heard of cases of children remembering past lives. And of course, back in the late 60s, he thought we'll investigate these cases and figure out what kind of psychiatric illness these children have. But they investigated them and then found that they could actually discover the person who the child claimed to have been before uh, and confirm the details that the child reported. And they have now, if you go to uvadops.org, you'll find they have now more than 2,500 cases they've investigated over six decades of past life memories in children. And 1,700 of those cases are, quote, solved. That is, they did the homework, they did the deep dive and the research. And remember that a lot of this work was done before the internet. So a lot of it was way back in the olden days when you really had to dig deep into news articles and all kinds of things to try and uncover these lives of people who had lived before being described by these children. But the fact is they're real. They're absolutely real. And the children have very real effects from that past life. So in other words, it's not just a vague access to a memory field that's just general. They come in with phobias. They have nightmares. These kids, their, their lives are dominated for months or years by these this uh, stuff that was residual from their past life. Uh, in fact, many of them, uh, I don't remember the exact percentage, but something like 25 or 30 percent of the cases of Stevenson actually had birthmarks that corresponded with the mortal lethal wound of the prior incarnation. I mean, it doesn't get more powerful than this. And yet so many people are just ignorant. They have not read the data. They say reincarnation is impossible. They say, I don't remember a past life. Well, guess what? Most of us don't, because as Jim Tucker and Ian Stevenson will tell you, you need to recover those memories before age five or six because there are natural processes. And you're a beautiful example of that, of someone whose parents tried to suppress it, but you knew what you knew. And uh, so those memories lived on. But for so many of us, those memories get suppressed at age six or seven. 
Uh, and then they can be uncovered later, like in an NDE, uh, in a profound spiritually transformative experience and uh, hypnotic regression with a therapist, uh, meditation, centering prayer. These are the ways I address past life uh, issues in my own situation. Uh, but it really, you know, and I was not aware of any of that literature before my coma. So that was a mind bender. But yes, the reincarnation literature is absolutely astonishing. It's one of the strongest pieces of evidence that our materialist model is a complete failure and that we need a much bigger model of understanding here to get brain, mind, and consciousness. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Now, let's come back for a moment to NDE. When one soul has had enough of this experience, but the character, the role that it was playing must continue for some greater purpose, is it possible that in some NDE cases, there is a soul swap over, so to speak, and another soul comes back to life to continue the work? Well, I th what you're referring to is something called the walk-in phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I, I've heard of certain indie ears who um, were labeled as walk-ins. In fact, some people have tried to claim that I was a walk-in. Uh, and yet to me, that makes absolutely zero sense. What do you think? Are you a walk-in? Uh, I, I think... Well, the, the thing you got to remember is that NDEs are incredibly powerful glimpses into a much larger universe. And when we glimpse that, uh, you know, we come back to this world and it can very dramatically change us. I mean, I was my whole worldview flipped 180 degrees from materialism to idealism. I really saw no other potential answer. And I think that's the important thing to remember is NDEs are shocking. They're, it's not expected. It's not anticipated. It's certainly not something you predict. That's why conventional scientists try and label them hallucinations because they can't understand them at all. <laughs> and yet, if you go through one, mm. oh boy, it, it, it just changes everything. And uh, uh, I mean, if I'd been the only person who have ever had an NDE, of course, it wouldn't be of much interest to anybody. But I'm one of you know, hundreds of millions of stories out there and probably billions and billions of examples of, you know, going through this kind of thing. And but this program forgetting that I talk about, you know, just as we said earlier, the memories disappear at age five or six. Uh, they get covered over natural processes. I guess that gives us skin in the game to have a kind of buy into this incarnation and not necessarily do it fully advised as our higher souls are. Uh, of all aspects of all of our incarnations and soul interactions and all that kind of thing. But this is where it's important to do the work as an individual. This is where the growth comes from, is from meditation. Uh, and that's why I, I use sacred acoustics, uh, you know, as we describe in Living in a Mindful Universe, binaural beat brainwave entrainment. People can learn more at sacredacoustics.com. But for me, I use that kind of technology for deep meditation an hour to a day. I've been doing that for more than a decade. Uh, and it's been of tremendous import to me. But it's, uh, I think the important thing for people to understand is our little ego mind and our little experience in these material bodies is only a tiny part of what's really going on in our existence. And the more we can become aware of that, uh, the better we can do with souls growing and transforming. Absolutely. Have you seen the movie Avatar? Yes. It was released in 2009, written and directed by James Cameron. That movie had a very strong and unusual emotional impact on people watching it, who were crying, weeping at the end, even though the movie had a happy ending. And the strangest thing was that the key emotions it evoked in so many people around the world were longing and grief. And that's how I felt when I watched the movie. Now, we can long and grieve only for something or someone we knew had and lost, and we want it back. And those emotions stayed with many people for a very long time. The story of that movie has deeply touched us and perhaps has reopened our unconscious memories of transitioning between one type of existence to another. 
from one reality to another. And the unanswered question that the story left hanging there was, which reality is real? What are your thoughts? My my thoughts are that all of it contributes from kind of a realistic perspective. And the more we can acknowledge the multiple kind of facets, the different perspectives that we can have on understanding our, our journey, um, that, I, that I think is the important thing. And then we have to take it all kind of into consideration and realize that all of that information is contributing to our growth and transformation as a soul. We're coming into a deeper understanding of our own relationship with the universe at large and certainly with all of our fellow beings that dwell in that universe. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, but it's a beautiful uh, example. I'm glad you pointed that out because the movie Avatar for me it awoke very deep kind of ancient memories of, uh, it reminded me, for example, of the tragedy uh, of, 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 Native, of Native Americans when the Europeans came. Uh, and uh, just this, this kind of headstrong, you know, we're right, you're wrong, uh, power move to take over. Uh, and you realize that uh, the, the, you know, the other civilization was, had so much uh, wisdom to it. And in so many ways, I look back on the wisdom of the Native American uh, population, and I look at what we've done. And yes, you can argue there's, you know, great success in in science and technology of the 20th, 21st century for medicine, communication, transportation, things like that. But by and large, what we're really seeing is the ugly underbelly of these technological successes, climate change, our addiction to fossil fuels, um, horrible uh, wealth in, in, uh, uh, inequality, um, you know, where it really all the 1% at the very tip top of the pile have more than the bottom half of population. And it's, that's just completely wrong for it to be like that. Uh, but again, it's corporate greed. And that's exactly what you saw in Avatar was that corporate greed and that kind of military where, you know, it's the military might uh, is the only way to to control things. And then you realize, no, it's not. And people cheered that, you know, the spirit that the united spirit of the, of the, of the warriors going up against these horrible oppressors, um, you know, the, the, the reflections of kind of our true earth history are myriad and they have to do with exactly what you're pointing out. It awakens a memory in us. We all kind of have these deep memories that, go back far before our birth and have to do with kind of the information heritage of, of humanity and, and really of sentience throughout the cosmos. And uh, that, that movie was a beautiful example of that. And I think we're absolutely at loggerheads with that particular uh, kind of conflict in our culture today, uh, because what we're seeing is this gigantic polarization of, you know, the, these powers of might and autocracy and, uh, ideologues, uh, demagogues, things like that, trying to control the masses, and the masses are not wanting to be controlled. And ultimately, there's going to be a major uh, kind of conflict to uh, allow some resolution of this incredible tension that's built up in our polarized world today. But that's where I'm optimistic, because I see a lot of this kind of message of the oneness of mind, uh, that we're all in this together, uh, our best of way forward is to show compassion, unconditional love, kindness, mercy, uh, take care of the least, the last, the lost, you know, refugees, homeless. Uh, These are all uh, fellow sentient beings, and we're all in this together. So we really need to shift our focus from this one of corporate greed and profit to one of uh, kind of maximal benefit for all of humanity and all of the world at large, given that our addiction to fossil fuels is also eminently leading to the extinction of literally, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of species that have taken, uh, you know, the better part of two to three billion years to evolve. You know, it's just madness that we have this kind of conflict in our current society, but it, it's a reckoning. We need to become wise. Homo sapiens, you know, we've named ourselves wise, <laughs> but uh, <Yeah. laughs> that doesn't necessarily show up in what we see in human destiny in the current state of the world. Absolutely. And speaking about shifting uh, the the uh, the awareness, shifting the focus and shifting the paradigm, shifting the whole narrative. I recently asked the spirit, what is the purpose of the war 
in Ukraine, beyond the politics, of course, but from the spiritual perspective. I was shown the cogwheels, big, small, of different sizes, all interconnected and driving each other in this invisible cosmic machine. So the message was that the war in Ukraine is part of the grand plan, an integral part of the global reset of the human consciousness. But then I asked, okay, but what is its purpose? And the message I received was somewhat surprising that the purpose of this war, beyond the politics, obviously, is to eliminate wastefulness and teach us to be more efficient with the resources we have and to literally live more consciously, in particular in developed countries. Now, this makes sense because, as we know, what we are facing now as the indirect consequences of this war and on the tail of the pandemic is shortages of pretty much everything and skyrocketing cost of living, of food, petrol, pretty much everything. So we are forced to become more mindful, more conscious of how we procure and how we use the resources that we have because we can no longer afford being wasteful. What are your thoughts on that? I agree uh, completely with that. And uh, a big part of the problem here, when we look at climate change, the corporate greed, our carbon dioxide, uh, you know, at unprecedented levels, that kind of thing, um, is that we've been living of, you know, a myth. We've been pretending that the earth uh, and the universe have infinite resources and that we can keep stripping and stripping and stripping everything we want. And it doesn't matter because we're homo sapiens. We can do anything. And yet that's not true. We're absolutely stressing this planet, you know, with seven, you know, eight billion people. Uh, we're really uh, uh, going over the deep end here. And it's because we demand too much and we rip too much out of the world. And it's not sustainable. What we need to do, just like those Native Americans for tens of thousands of years, they lived in natural harmony with the, with the natural world. Uh, and that's what we need to get back to, is a much more fundamentally sustainable uh, interaction with our surroundings that does not demand that we rip all the resources out of the ground, burn all the trees, you know, and, and uh, drive our cars from site to site to commit all these crimes. Uh, we need to adopt a kind of a simpler, a more uh, life-focused lifestyle where we're really just uh, working on our interactions with our fellow beings and, and doing good for the world. I mean, the, so many people find this, the current world to be so kind of damning in its uh, uh, kind of meaninglessness. And then they discover that really they've been too ego-focused. You know, and our world is just toxic, a wash in this uh, ego uh, insanity and ego is right at the heart of of say addictions alcoholism you know that just ravage millions of lives around this world uh, that's all ego toxicity and in many ways what we're talking about here in terms of corporate greed and uh, ripping resources from the earth beyond uh, sustainable levels etc is a form of kind of ego maniacal demand and the more we can kind of unite more with higher soul, um, and the higher soul is connected and sees the benefit uh, of helping others and of bringing love to this world. Uh, so the more we can live our lives to that kind of higher soul approach and not just be busy stripping resources from the earth, trying to get the mo most toys before we die, things like that, but instead working for the higher good, helping others, um, and just appreciating the uh, the benefit of bringing goodness to this world in all of our interactions through kindness, mercy, uh, acceptance, forgiveness. Uh, that's really how we can change the world for the better. And that's what I think is inevitable uh, if we are to thrive in the coming decades and centuries, is we really need to flip this thing around, uh, which I think is, is happening. Uh, the scientific community, in my mind, there's no doubt there's a giant revolution going on around consciousness and brain and mind. And uh, we're coming to a point where the scientific community will end up proving that we're spiritual beings in a spiritual universe. It's really about the only way to satisfactorily answer uh, the issues of quantum mechanics is to understand that mind is primary in the universe and the brain only serves as a filter 
for that primordial love. <laughs> yes, absolutely. In one of the many presentations that you gave and I was listening to on online, there was one particular thing that I really loved. <laughs> you were asked a question about hell. And before that, you were talking about that life review when we cross over. And I really loved what you said because it it ties together our physical life and physical reality with our spiritual purpose and our objective. Because you said that we don't need to wait for the life review at the end once we've crossed over. Let's review our life at the end of each day <laughs> and correct those little things and situations that perhaps we are not very proud of or we would want to change we don't need to wait until the end of this life. Let's do it every day because in this way we will we can really live consciously, as you were saying. Could you elaborate on this? I, I really love it. Yes, and I must I must credit my uh, life partner and uh, the co-author of the book Living in a Mindful Universe, Karen Newell, who's also the co-founder of SacredAcoustics.com. Uh, she's the one who taught me about the daily review. Uh, because I was all focused, you know, as I was uh, making sense of my own experience and then reading about, you know, so many other NDEs and seeing the overlaps and all that, I was absolutely astonished by the power of this life review. And to me, it explained notions of hell um, are just people who had brought a lot of greed and kind of suffering to others in their lifetime. And then their life review, they had to be on the receiving end of all that. And that's not fun. It could certainly seem hellish. Uh, but Karen had the great wisdom to teach me about the daily review, which really is another way of saying that the deepest lessons for NDEs are not just about what happens when I die, but the deepest lessons are about how do I live each moment of this life today with that kind of knowledge so that when I actually die, I don't have all these tremendous regrets over the fact that I wasted my entire life thinking that materialism was correct. You know, and, and many people come to that discovery at the very end. That's when loved ones appear to them, tell them, no, this is this is real. The afterlife is absolutely more real than anything you've ever been through yet. So, uh, you know, this is uh, the daily review is a beautiful opportunity yeah. to make amends, to bring your life into alignment, to focus on the higher good, uh, to forgive others and to seek uh, forgiveness, you know, when necessary. But always remembering that the 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 biggest beneficiary of forgiveness is the forgiver. You know, they're the ones who have made a self-imposed prison that they free themselves from by forgiving, by that act of forgiving. Uh, so it's uh, there's tremendous wisdom that can come from this deeper understanding of who we are that goes far beyond the little ego voice, the little voice in our head. You know, so many people think that's who they are. That's what they identify with, that running stream of thought. But I remind them of what Michael Singer calls that voice in your head in his book, The Untethered Soul. He calls it the annoying roommate. <laughs> and that's about as far as we can go with that little ego mind. So, uh, you know, spending months and years meditating, developing my relationship across the veil with that higher soul, with that God force, uh, that has enabled me uh, to really kind of smile at the efforts of that Evan Alexander ego to do some of the things it wants to do. But the bottom line is we're all much more than just birth to death and nothing more. This this incarnation, we're much more than that. And that's where meditation and centering prayer can really open the doors because that's what allows us to go out into the universe uh, at will. Yes, I agree with you that meditation is extremely important. I uh, practice and teach, in fact, what I call theta meditation, which is where you lower your brain waves down to the theta level, just between sleep and, and the waking state, This, which is also called transcendental meditation, uh, because this is that beautiful space where you can access those other dimensions. It's often referred to as the hypnagogic space. Yes, I absolutely love theta meditation or this transcendental meditation because that's where 
you can get to this space that you've so beautifully described of losing your physical body, losing your ego and being pure consciousness and being able then to connect to other dimensions, other realities, the wisdom of the universe, you name it. All that what really is important beyond the the physicality. So in this case, what is karma? Well, I think karma is, it just reflects the fact that our soul over these multiple lifetimes with our many choices and actions and thoughts uh, defines a pathway. It's a pathway of transformation and growth. Uh, and, and I would say that that uh, kind of evolution of who we are in that higher sense uh, is really the purpose for existence for the universe. Uh, I came to realize, you know, within months after my journey, when I read Pierre Tillard de Chardin's book, The Phenomenon of Man, I came to realize how evolution is absolutely happening, but it's much more than just, you know, biological evolution on Earth in Darwinian sense, uh, but a much grander form of transformation, evolution uh, of all sentience throughout the cosmos. And I would say that's what we are witnessing now. That's what we are seeing. And I would say that the current kind of uh, tension and uh, uh, attempt at resolution in the scientific community is one that really reflects, uh, you know, on the order of 5,000 years or so of human destiny and history. I mean, this is not a short-term cycle of resolution and understanding, but in many ways, we're coming to some of the deepest wisdom uh, from ancient civilizations that has a a real uh, powerful basis in deep exploration of the nature of reality. And that's what we're finding is uh, this idea of oneness and the binding force of love that is so apparent in the modern study of things like NDEs and, and, you know, the more exotic examples of conscious experience in human beings. They lead us into a a deeper understanding of the big picture. Uh, And each and every one of us as individuals can take advantage of that uh, kind of emerging front of understanding uh, through our own meditations and prayers and our own efforts at kind of healing self and others, bringing self and others into wholeness. Uh, And that's where I think this revolution can uh, have a tremendous benefit for all of humanity. Mm, Beautifully said. Now, Eben, to encapsulate this delightful conversation, which could go on forever, (laughs) I would like to ask you this. The Hamlet's famous soliloquy, to be or not to be, that is the question, is somewhat outdated, I would think, as now we understand that we cannot not be, as we always exist as a soul for eternity through many incarnations. I am curious, how would you modernize this question? Well, I would say it's it's almost like, do you have the will to engage or not? In other words, the will to, uh, you know, as Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. So this is about paying attention uh, to kind of the deep aspects of our life, our choices, our being, uh, our relationship to others, and our entire journey. And I think that this uh, kind of grander view of what we're doing here and and this interaction. And uh, especially when you see so much of what appears to be kind of mindless um, and polarizing kind of misinformation out there in the world, uh, you start to realize that uh, we really owe more to ourselves in terms of a a deeper understanding of our common nature. And that's where I think uh, this kind of uh, deep uh, dive and, uh, you know, research, meditation, uh, you know, living these concepts and not just talking about them uh, is where we can really gain a uh, tremendous satisfaction in life. Uh, so many of the problems in this world are because of frustrated egos and people thinking they are their ego, as opposed to realizing they're far grander, kind of higher souls than that. And as such, they're much more uh, naturally focused on the on the highest and best good for all involved. And that's really kind of a natural accomplishment of this uh, uh, kind of growth of souls that we're talking about through this process of, of deeper understanding and mindfulness at large. So we can say to engage or not to engage. 
That is the question. <laughs> right. That, that's kind of it. And, and to examine your life, not just kind of bounce around like a random piece of flotsam or jetsam, you know, tossed about on the wave tops, but to engage. Engage in the process. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a, a process of, of uh, you know, taking yourself seriously and uh, trying to understand how you and the universe uh, overlap and, you know, Ultimately, finding there are no limits. The universe has a mind, and each and every one of us share that mind. Uh, and we can dive into that shared aspect. And for me, the word spiritual uh, really just has two components. Uh, one is this notion of connection through the one mind, which is something that we extrapolate on tremendously through the entire book, Living in a Mindful Universe. We make the point of objective idealism as the correct answer. And that's where a lot of other philosophers and uh, cognitive scientists are going now is in the very same direction. Uh, so this is really about uh, understanding uh, how idealism can really work and how it can make sense of our lives as human beings and also refocus us on our abilities uh, of, of will, of having will to basically manifest the universe of our dreams. Uh, and that's what we're here to do is to shift this universe to a much higher vibration of collective understanding and togetherness where we're here to help each other. Absolutely. And this is a beautiful summary of this lovely conversation. Thank you so much, Evan. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on my Quantum Living podcast. I will, of course, include all the links to your social media website and your books in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anna, so much for having me on. Thanks for all the work you do. Uh, and certainly I would encourage people to visit me at ebonalexander.com, learn more about the meditation at sacredacoustics.com, uh, and also invite people to a set of free webinars that Karen and I did during the pandemic, interviews with noted luminaries on consciousness around the world and other experiencers that can be found at unitedinhopeandhealing.com. Yes, I'll include all the links in the show notes. That would be excellent. Thank you so much, Anna. I appreciate it. Thank you so much and all the best. Namaste. All right. Namaste. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes and other podcast info, please go to my website at quantumliving.com.au forward slash podcast. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well. Music